Portainer, Portainer did something awesome. Not that Portainer wasn't awesome before, but they did something really awesome in Portainer 2.0. So hats off to them because I'm sure this wasn't an easy task. What did they do that was so awesome that they weren't doing before? Well, they added Kubernetes support. Hey, welcome back, so I'm Techno Tim, and today we're gonna talk about Portainer 2.0. Now, with more Kubernetes. As a quick reminder, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so if you wanna continue the conversation about Portainer there, we can. So let's talk about Portainer 2.0. As you already know, Portainer has supported Docker for quite some time. They've given you an easy way to spin up Docker on your own home machine. And that included a great UI to manage your whole entire Docker infrastructure. But what you may not have realized is that under the covers, they were using Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm is Docker's very own container orchestration framework. It does things like load balancing, service discovery, cluster management, and a lot more features. And if you've been using Portainer, you may or may not have been using some of these features. But there are other orchestration frameworks out there, big ones like Kubernetes. And with Kubernetes comes some additional complexity, just like setting up Swarm would. So in 2.0, Portainer has made it really easy to install, manage, and configure Kubernetes. So what does this mean for you at home running Portainer or possibly looking at Kubernetes? Well, now you can have both. Now, I'll admit that you may not use all of the features of Kubernetes. And a lot of people may be asking, why would I use Kubernetes at home? I get this question a lot in my live stream, so I figured I'd address it here. A lot of big and small companies are running Kubernetes. It's changed the way we build, manage, and deploy applications. And while this might seem like overkill for home or your home lab environment, it's a great way to start learning about Kubernetes. Personally, I use Kubernetes at home because I'm a software engineer. And being able to build and deploy and maintain my code at home, just as I would on a public cloud, is important to me. And while this may not be important to you, it's still a great way to learn about Kubernetes in your home lab environment. And there's a huge community around it. But ultimately, the choice is going to be up to you. And if you choose to go with Kubernetes, just know that Portainer 2.0 has your back. So today, in this video, we're going to set up Portainer 2.0. We'll start with nothing and we'll end up with Portainer 2.0 in a Kubernetes cluster that we can add workloads to. Then you can take it as far as you want to go. So with that out of the way, let's get started. The first thing you're going to need is a Linux server. I'm going with the latest Ubuntu LTS server. Then once you have that running, we'll need to install Docker. To install Docker, we'll SSH into our Linux server. Then we'll follow the standard commands from Docker to install it. First, we'll update apt, then we'll install some dependencies, then we'll install Docker's GPG key, then we'll compare fingerprints to make sure they match, then we'll add their repository, then we'll update apt again, then we'll install Docker. Next, we'll run a command so that we don't have to use sudo every time we run Docker. Then we'll have to log out and log back in. Then we should be able to run a Docker command without sudo, something like Docker version, and see our output. So this all looks good, Docker's running. Next, we'll need to install kube control. Now, I've heard this pronounced a few ways. So far, I've heard kube control, kubectl, kube control, kubectl, and kube cuddle. But anyway, we'll need to get this installed on our server. So that's as simple as copying and pasting this curl command. So that downloaded kube control, then we'll need to make it executable, then we'll move the binary to our path, then we should be able to run a command like kube control version dash dash client and see some output. And in our terminal, we can see an output. Next, we'll need to install K3D. So K3D is a little lightweight utility by Rancher that helps you install K3S. Now, K3S is a lightweight Kubernetes cluster, but we'll install that here in a second. But first we need K3D. So we'll copy and paste K3D and execute it. So once we have K3D installed, now we can install K3S, which is the lightweight version of Kubernetes. So here's the K3D command we're going to run. I've gotten this directly from Portainer, but I'll explain what it means. So K3D cluster create Portainer, it's going to create our Portainer cluster. The first argument of dash dash API port 6443 is the port that the cluster will be available on. And this is the port that kubectl will use. The next argument of dash dash server one is how many servers we're gonna use or how many nodes. The next argument of dash dash agent is how many agents we want. And this is essentially how many agent nodes we want to create. For the sake of this tutorial, we'll create one, but you could create more here. And dash p, 
These are the ports we're going to expose from the Docker host to our cluster. Since we're exposing this using node port, we're going to expose the entire node port range. And this is how you do it. We run that command and it should start spinning up our cluster now. One quick tip is, if you're using ZSH or ZShell, you'll have to put quotes around the P parameter, like I did here. But if you're using plain old bash, you don't need to worry about this and you can copy and paste the documentation, which by the way, is in my GitHub or the Discord link. Okay, so this created our portainer cluster. We can see here it pulled down the images and spun them up. And if we run kube control cluster info, we'll see this here. And now that we've created our cluster, we can actually spin up Portainer. We can find this on Portainer's GitHub page. So if we scroll down, we want to choose the node port installation. And that's as simple as copying and pasting this curl command. So let's do that. Okay, so we've downloaded the YAML file. Now let's apply it. Okay, so that created our Portainer app. And now we should be able to access Portainer on port 3077. And here it is. So we'll create our user. Next, we'll choose the environment we want to manage. So in this case, it's Kubernetes, and now we're in Portainer. So let's turn on the storage option, and we can save this configuration. And here's our Kubernetes cluster. Let's take a look at it. So here's our dashboard for our Kubernetes cluster. And then we can take a look at resource pools, see some applications we have running, see our configurations, check out our volumes, see our clusters. And so this is kind of important. So here we can see the two nodes we created, Here's the one agent we created, and then our main Kubernetes server. And then if we go in the setup, we'll see some of the stuff we saw in the beginning. And then we have user management features. So we can create users, or create teams, or create endpoints, registries, and then our system-wide settings for Portainer. Here we can even choose our authentication method. So these are things you're probably familiar with if you're already running Portainer, but I wanted to show them again in Kubernetes. So how would we create a Kubernetes workload? Well, we would just create a Portainer app. So let's go into Applications, and let's add an application. And so let's spin up a Minecraft server. Now I know what you're thinking, that Minecraft probably isn't the best way to showcase what Kubernetes can do. Kubernetes has a ton of management features that Minecraft probably won't be able to take advantage of, but I wanted to show this as a proof of work that we could get it running in Kubernetes on Portainer. And you'll probably run into this too as you grow out your Kubernetes cluster. You'll find workloads that are a great fit for Kubernetes, that you can scale, that have health check endpoints, and take advantage of a lot of Kubernetes features. But then you might have workloads like this, where you don't want to spin up in plain old Docker, and so you just want to add them to your Kubernetes cluster. And I think that's how a lot of Kubernetes clusters are. A mix of workers, services, agents, websites, you name it. And some can scale, some cannot. Some have health endpoints, some do not. So it's going to be up to you to investigate those features, but I highly recommend that once you move to Kubernetes, you move all of your Docker workloads into Kubernetes too. So let's get Minecraft configured. So let's name this Minecraft. The image, that's right here, it's itzg slash minecraft dash server. The resource pool will keep to default. So Portana has this idea of stacks, and so you can group your workloads by stack, but if you don't specify one, Portainer will create one for you. And that's based on the name. But let's create one. This one's called Minecraft. And so Minecraft does need some environment variables. The first one we're gonna add is EULA true, and this is to accept the EULA. Add this if you do. The next one is going to be TZ, and this stands for time zone. Mine's America slash Chicago. Next, we'll want to persist some data. This will ensure that when you reboot your Minecraft server, you don't lose all your server data. So here, we're going to add a persisted folder. The path in the container is slash data. And since this is our first volume, we'll have to specify the volume size. Let's give it 10 gigs. Next, you can choose how much memory and CPU to allocate to this workload but I'm going to keep them both to unlimited. The next thing we'll do is we need to choose where to publish this workload. We can choose whether we want to publish this internally or on the cluster, so let's choose cluster. And last, we'll need to choose a port. This Docker image has exposed Minecraft on the standard port, which is 25565. So we'll want to choose that for the inside, but for the outside, we're going to let Portainer choose the node port. So you can see it here. So it's chosen 30080, and you can adjust this within the node port range, but you can't adjust it outside of that node port range. So if everything looks good here, we can deploy this application. We click deploy, and right now this should be pulling down the Docker image and adding it to our Kubernetes cluster. We can refresh here, or we can go inside of this workload and refresh here. 
and it looks like it's replicated. So before we check it out, let's check a few other things while we're in here. If you ever need to update your Minecraft server, it's as easy as clicking redeploy. And this applies to any Docker image that's pinned to latest. And if you didn't specify latest as your tag, it will automatically use latest. So let's redeploy. And we redeployed. And if we scroll down to our pods, we can see our pod here. And you can see I have a typo in the name, but that's really not gonna affect the pod at all. But we can go in here, we can see the logs from the server. So the server's running. And if we go back, we can actually exec into that pod now too. If we click connect, we're inside of this pod, do an LS, and we can see our Minecraft data. So this gives us some pretty good administration from a web UI. And if you really wanted to see the YAML, you can see it here by clicking YAML. Now, unfortunately, the name of this application is read-only. I'd love to see Portainer make this editable, or at least let me clone it, name it something else, and then let me delete this one really easily. So it'd be great to have a clone feature right here. But this is all new and still under development. So once we're in Minecraft, we'll choose multiplayer. And from here, let's add a Minecraft server. So we'll click add server, and I'll call this Minecraft server Portainer. I know, real creative. And so the IP address is gonna be the IP address of your Portainer server. Next, we'll need to add our port. So we'll add a colon. And then to find our port, we'll go back into application details and we'll look here under cluster node port. And this is the port that was assigned to this application, 31156. So we'll paste that in here, click done, and it found our server. Let's connect. Okay, and it looks like we're inside of our server playing Minecraft. But just to make sure we're inside of this server, let's take a look at the logs. So if we're in our application details, we should be able to scroll all the way down to see this pod. And let's look at logs. And we can scroll down to see our logs. And we can see right here that Techno Tim joined the game. That's awesome. Okay, so let's disconnect from our server and we'll close out of Minecraft. Then we'll refresh the logs page and we can see I left the game. So that's how easy it is to get started with Portainer and Kubernetes. This is a huge milestone for Portainer. Building your entire system to work with another Docker orchestration framework is a huge leap, but it's a leap I'm glad they made. And welcome to Kubernetes, Portainer. We're glad you're here. So what do you think of Portainer 2.0? What do you think of Portainer adopting Kubernetes? If you're using Portainer 1, do you see yourself moving to Portainer 2 and adopting Kubernetes? If so, let me know in the comments section below. And while you're down there, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you have more questions, you can always join my live stream. I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so if you have a question about this video or any of my other videos, hop in my stream and I'd love to have you. So, thanks so much for watching and till next time, stream on my friends. I want um, Kubernetes um, so that I can do certain things in Kubernetes and so I, I get Rancher because it, it makes Kubernetes uh, really easy even though Kubernetes is super hard and complicated. Um, and from that, you know, I also get Docker. But like, I think Portainer is also awesome as well. Because for me, at the end of the day, like I love to see people containerizing things. And I know, I know we have, you know, the whole Docker camp and the LXC camp, and I, I think they're both awesome. Anything I think you can do to isolate, you know, processes or processes, um, and keep them separate and make it immutable and make it repeatable and only manage config is a win for me. And so that's why I, I, I love Docker, love Kubernetes, love Rancher, love Portainer, even love LXC, even though I barely used it.